I apologize, we're running just a little bit behind this morning. As you might have noticed, I'm wearing a microphone. Uh, we are recording this series of classes, so that's the only reason I'm wearing one. Uh, and so I think in about two and a half years, this is the first time I've used one of these. I have no idea what I'm doing. So it took me a little while to get it all figured out, get it all sorted out, but it sounds like it's working. Uh, you may appreciate that. You may not. You may not like being able to hear me so well, but... It is what it is, so we're going to roll with it. We are so very glad you're here with us this morning. We're continuing uh, our, our series about personal evangelism, how to go about reaching the lost, how to go about reaching out to people, st setting up studies, what to do during those studies, those sorts of things. Uh, of course, Kenley and Jake have done a great job the last couple of weeks. It's my turn today. Uh, I'm not sure who's, at, who's the next up after me. I, I don't think it's me. If, if it is, I'm going to be real surprised when I go look at that after class today. Uh, but I think uh, Jake may be up next week. I'm not sure. We'll keep kind of alternating, going back and forth on this. I'll tell you in advance this morning, what we're going to talk about is a little bit dull. It's a little bit dry. All we're looking at this morning is how to set up your study. So just some things you, you might uh, not have thought about, things you might want to keep in mind. Some of them are going to be incredibly uh, rudimentary. Some of them may be things that Wow, that's never occurred to me before. That's something I never thought about. Uh, we have a lot to go through. I don't know that we'll get through it all. What I've done, I've printed off an extra copy of my notes it's sitting back there next to Ryan. If you want to have a copy of all of this when it's said and done, I can go in there, shoot out some copies real quick, give them to you. You can have that to hold in your hands, whatever. Because uh, also, I know you'll be shocked, I didn't create a PowerPoint for this either because I hate creating PowerPoints. So I didn't do that. So if you want a copy of the notes, I'll tell you this right now, none of this is my material. I ripped this off from a bunch of other people, so I have no problem giving you the stuff I ripped off from other people anyway. That's not going to hurt my feelings one bit. Uh, give you a, a, a quick overview of what, where this came from. Uh, a, a good friend of mine, he was actually the preacher in Marshall when I was a little bitty boy, about Mason's age. Left Marshall, went back to Stephenville where he'd come from, and shortly after he went back to Stephenville, they sent him overseas full-time again as a missionary. Man, it was probably, probably the greatest personal worker I've ever seen. As far as his ability to sit down with someone one-on-one, -on -one, study the Bible with them, and lead them to Christ. Phenomenal, phenomenal skill set he had in that regard. Consequently, he's got his own Bible study that he put together specifically for that purpose. He's got uh, a couple of different DVDs out there through World Video Bible School. He's written some books about this. Uh, he's since passed on. He's been passed away now. For, uh, he passed away about 20 years ago or so, I guess. But most of what we've got here comes straight from, uh, the guy's name is Bobby Bates. Most of this material comes straight from Bobby Bates, from the things he said. Uh, some of it's been adapted. His, his approach was more a cold call, you go knock on somebody's door, a complete stranger, and how to get in the door with them and sit down with them for a Bible study. We're operating under the assumption that whomever we are studying with is someone you know personally. It's a, uh, a relative, it's a neighbor, it's a co-worker, it's a family friend, whatever. So we're, we're, we're skipping past some of those things he had where you're trying to uh, talk to a complete stranger and get your foot in the door to set up a Bible study with them. We're assuming you know this person, you have a great relationship with them, and they have even agreed to have a study with you. And so we're approaching it from that point of the things we need to cover, things that need to be addressed uh, as you go into that study. Now as you think of all that, before you ever even start the study, before you ever even get to their house, before, or wherever it is you're having the study, there's some things you need to do, some preliminaries to the study. The first thing that is strongly recommended and this phrase is going to sound terrible, I apologize, but I know of no other way to say it. Go out and buy you a cheap, replaceable version of the Bible. And the reason for that is, I'm assuming a lot of you either have lots of things marked in your Bibles already, or you might be one of those people that for whatever reason you do not want to, to mark, highlight, write, whatever in your Bible. There are people like that out there, and that's, that's great, that's fine. Go find you a copy of the Bible that A, you don't mind marking in and writing in and highlighting and underlining and, make, and find one, too, that doesn't have everything already highlighted and marked and underlined. At various points during the course of your study, 
There may be things you want to really emphasize, you want to really point out to the prospect you were studying with. It's a lot more, uh, has a lot more of an impact on them if right there in front of them you're underlining those key things, underlining that key point you want them to see rather than it's already there, they already see it, it's already underlined, you know, you did it before you got there, maybe you did it 20, 30 years ago, whatever the case may be. So go out and find you a copy of the Bible that you don't mind marking in, okay? Other thing you certainly want to do, build this into your schedule. Don't just say, oh, hey, we'll get to this at some point. We'll, we'll sit down sometime. Hey, what about Thursday night at 6.30? What about during our lunch break today, Tuesday afternoon? Schedule a set time. This is when we're going to get together. You're, you're interested in studying the Bible. Don't just say, oh, hey, we need to sit down sometime and talk about this, okay? Schedule a time for it. Now, maybe... Maybe you don't have anybody particularly interested right now in studying with you. That's okay. We're, we're working toward that, okay? So maybe you don't have that yet. Then you need to schedule your own personal time preparing yourself. Don't, don't just think this is one of those things that, oh, when the time comes, I'll be ready and we'll rock and roll with it. This is a skill that has to be developed just like anything else. If you spend time developing that skill, practicing that skill, honing that skill, you're going to be better at it. I guarantee you set up a Bible study with someone the first time you do it, there's going to be things you leave that study, oh, I wish I would have done that. Oh, I wish I would have said that. Oh, they mentioned this. I should have said such and such. That's going to happen. That happens all the time. Everything we do in life, that happens, right? Schedule time to prepare yourself. Schedule time to, to study the Word. Schedule time to prepare yourself to engage in personal work with people whether that's studying with them or that's preparing for a study you will have tomorrow you will have next week a study you hope to have one day schedule that time regularly to help prepare yourself the number one tool you're going to have in your arsenal in all of this is going to be prayer pray and i'm going to tell you this right now let other people know you've got, you've got a study coming up. Let somebody know. Let me know. Let the elders know. Let Jake know. Let's, let some of, these, some of your brothers and sisters here at church know about it. Let us pray for you. Let us pray for, for your strength and your courage during that study. Let us pray for your wisdom, for your guidance during that study. Don't, don't feel like you have to go in there alone. Don't feel like you're going in there and you're the only one that can pray about it. Let us know. Let us pray for the success of that study let's pray for there to be receptive hearts now something you want to try and do as much as possible dress as neatly as you can and what I mean by that very simply <coughs> excuse me what I mean by that very simply you know for example if I'm gonna study with one of our football coaches and hey we're gonna study as soon as we get off the practice field Tuesday afternoon we're gonna study well I'm not gonna come in and go in and take a shower and put on you know, some khakis and a polo shirt and get all fancied up just for us to sit there in the coach's office and study the Bible. That, that would, honestly, I think that would be a waste of time. So, you know, if you're, you're working at your job, whatever, y'all are studying during your lunch break, maybe you're, you know, doing manual labor that particular day, whatever, you're dirty, you're, whatever, that's fine. Now, if you set up a study at some point, you know, hey, we're going to go over here to so-and-so's house, we're going to eat supper, don't show up, just dress like a slob. It, this is important. What you're doing is important. Show up like, show up dress like it's important. You want to present the appearance from the very minute you walk in that what we are doing is critical. What we are doing is essential. It is valuable. So you don't want to walk in as much as possible and say, oh, yeah, I just threw on some clothes, whatever, you know, that sort of thing. Dress like it is important. And they're going to treat it like it's a much more important event. Other thing you want to do, and this is a personal, the, the, the more I talk, the more y'all get to know me, y'all are going to find out just how crazy I am, okay? Have something to freshen your breath with. Every, every Sunday I come to church, I've got a package full of Altoids in my pocket. My mortal fear is that you and I get in a conversation, y'all already know that secondary to that is that we're going to get in a conversation and my breath is going to stink. 
And the only thing you're going to be able to focus on is, my goodness, his breath is terrible. When's the last time he brushed his teeth? I, I'm, I'm not lying about that. I, I've got every pair of jeans I have, I've got a, a small package of Altoids sitting in it. Every suit coat I have has a package of Altoids in it. I chew gum like crazy at school all day long because I'm scared to death I'm going to get in a conversation with somebody and my breath is going to smell bad. Now, y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all have had those conversations with people that they get right up close to you and you're thinking, my goodness, when did they eat, what did they eat and when did they eat it? That is terrible. And you can't focus on anything they've got to say. You can't follow any sort of thought process. All you can think about is... I cannot wait to get away from them because this smell is just absolutely horrid. You don't want that to happen. You want the people you were studying with, you want them to be able to focus on the Word of God and nothing else. Carry with you some breath mints, some Tic Tacs, some Altoids. Uh, I've, I've got a little bit of a cough going on this morning. I've got a throat lozenge in my mouth right now. So if you come talk to me, it's going to smell kind of cherry, kind of medicine-y, but it, you're going to smell that. You're not going to smell nasty breath, all right? Whatever it may be, have something there so that people aren't focused on how terrible your breath is. <clears throat> now, this is both a safety issue and something to increase the efficiency of the study. Go with a partner when possible. You recall Jesus originally sent out his disciples two by two, right? Pretty good model. Now, we live, unfortunately, in a very crazy world. So as a general rule, it's good for us to go out in pairs just for safety, if nothing else. Now, presumably, you know, you're going somewhere and you're studying with somebody you know, and that's all, all well and good. Presumably, you're going to be in a safe environment. You still want to take a partner with you, if at all possible. That partner could be your spouse. It could be somebody else. It doesn't matter who the partner is, but you want to take a partner with you. And we'll, we'll get to the, the, the purpose of the partner here uh, in just a few moments. Now, let's say you go to someone's house, you're visiting with them, maybe you go to someone's place of business, whatever, you're studying with them. Very critical point here, be very mindful of where you park your car. Do not, if you have to park on the street, if you have to park six blocks away, it doesn't matter, do not park where you block somebody in. And the reason for that, very simple, you don't want to get to the crit a critical point in that study and somebody says, hey, I need to leave. Whose car is this out here? Would you move your car for me? Because now you, you've interrupted that train of thought. You've interrupted their focus on the point you're making about the Word of God, about their need to respond to the gospel. Now all of a sudden you've got it. Oh, hey, hold on, hold on just one second. Let me go out here, move my car, back it out, all that. The moment's lost. Maybe the opportunity's been lost. You missed a chance there to really hammer home the gospel message. And again, this is one of those things, maybe you've thought of that, maybe you haven't. Maybe it wouldn't matter. But it's one of those things, you can ask Callaway about this, I'm very much a, let's try and plan for every scenario, let's try and make sure that whatever could go wrong, we plan to keep it from, from going wrong, so we don't have to worry about it. So don't park your car behind anybody else, then you don't have to worry about how that may disrupt the study. Be enthusiastic about what you're studying. That's probably the number one thing I could tell you about all of this. Be enthusiastic. How many of you would like to come into Bible class this morning and listen to me and just have me stand here like this and talk in a monotone for 45 minutes, not move around, make no, no movement whatsoever. I just stand here, I look at my notes, and I just talk in a monotone for 45 minutes. That would be absolutely horrible, right? Y'all would be more bored than you already are. Some of y'all might appreciate the nap. I don't know. Be excited about it. Be enthusiastic about it. We've got the greatest thing that we can ever give to this person. We've got the message of salvation. We're not trying to sell them a new car. We're not trying to sell them uh, some Tupperware, some Amway, or whatever else it is that people sell now. We're not trying to sell them a bunch of junk. We're trying to sell them. We're trying to give them salvation. We're trying to bring them to heaven be excited about that. Be enthusiastic about that because we've got the greatest message that has ever been told to share with someone. And presumably we're sharing it with this person we know and we love because of our love for them. Yes, Doug. There you go. That's what I should have started off with. I could have said that a lot faster, couldn't 
We have, we have not just good news, we have the good news to tell them, right? Let's tell it like it's good news. You, know, you, you wouldn't walk up to somebody, yeah, well, you know, Ryan and I are having another kid. We're not, by the way, that's just an example. <laughs> just an example. But I wouldn't walk in and tell you, well, yeah, we're having. I'm going to walk in and, guys, guess what? Then when the reality of what the grocery bill is going to be like one day sets in, it might be, well, man, we're having another kid. What but initially, we're going to be excited about that. That's good news. Go tell people the gospel message and be excited, be enthusiastic about it because it is the good news. Now, the other thing we want to do, we want people to be excited about studying the Word of God. We want people to be excited about engaging the study. This is going to sound counterintuitive as much as possible. Let's limit the number of people in that study. You don't want to walk in and teach a room full of 20, 25 people. You want to make it a lot more personal. You want to make it, maybe it's you and your co-worker and their spouse. Maybe it's you, your co-worker, their spouse. And maybe they've got a couple of kids that are older. You want to make it a relatively small gathering because once you start teaching a large group of people, A, it's harder to make those personal connections with people that you really want to make as you're studying. But B, there's a lot larger possibility of things getting sidetracked, hijacked, etc. Okay? So you want to try and limit that number of people as much as you can. They say, hey, I've got all these other people that want to study. Great. How can I get in contact with them? Give me a phone number, an email address, whatever. Let me get in touch with them. I'll set up a time to study with them as well. Okay? Don't turn down an opportunity to study with those people. Just try and limit the amount of people that are going to be in your study so you can have the greatest possible impact on the folks that are there. Now, I mentioned we want to go out in partners. Your partner is a silent partner. And when I say silent partner, I mean they are a silent partner. All right? Your job, if you go out as the silent partner, we want to do whatever we can to facilitate the study. That's your job. And that's going to look different every time you do it. But your job is to make it as easy as possible for the prospect you're studying with and the person leading the study to sit down uninterrupted and focus on studying God's Word. As I mentioned, that may look different for every study. It's going to depend on the circumstances. You know, let's say you're studying with uh, a preacher from another religious group. You're probably not going to have to help them locate a bunch of passages in the Bible. Let's say you're studying with someone that doesn't really go to church, hasn't darkened the doors of a church building in 20, 30 years, doesn't even have a Bible in their home. You're probably going to have to sit there and help that person locate some passages in their Bible. What you need to do is help them locate those passages. Maybe, maybe you help the person leading the study and the prospect, y'all alternate reading passages out of the Bible. You want, to read the, you want to read those passages out loud as you're conducting the study. You don't want them to just look at it. You want them to hear those words as they're being said. So maybe you help them find it. Maybe you help read. You want to sit there beside your partner, whoever's leading the study. Lots of nodding. You should look, you're going to look at times like a bobblehead doll. Because if they're making some great point about the gospel, you should just sit there and just nod your head. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's a great point. You don't say anything. Because again, you're the silent partner. But you want them to understand, yes, yeah, what they're saying is correct. You're, you were there to support. You were there to encourage. You're there, again, to facilitate the study however possible. You're the silent partner. Don't look bored. I don't care if you are. Don't look it. Look like you need to look every second of that study like you were just hanging on every word that your partner is saying. You need to look, again, this goes back to enthusiasm. You need to look like this is the greatest thing you've ever heard. This is the greatest thing you've ever been a part of. You need to look happy. You need to look enthusiastic and excited throughout the entire study. Now, again, you're, yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and of course, then the, the other thing, kind of along those same lines, what you want to do, if they have a Bible, you want them to study from their Bible. 
There's been countless numbers of times. So, well, well, that's what your Bible says. No, it's not. Yours says the same thing. Go, go look at yours and see what it says. It says the same exact thing mine does. So absolutely, if you can, leave that Bible with them that you've, you've marked, you've highlighted, so they know here's the key point about this passage, that passage, whatever. But as they're studying, and we'll get to this, well, we may get to this, I don't know. But one of the other aspects of this is you want to study with them, you want them using, if they have a Bible, you want them to use their Bible. Because now it's along, well, that's what your Bible says. No, you're reading exactly what your Bible says. It's right there in that Bible you've got sitting on your coffee table or that you take to church or work or wherever with you. All day, every day, it's in your Bible saying the exact same things that my Bible says as well. Yes? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and, and that's that's one hundred percent correct. You know, and, and that's the case in anything. If we're not going to, wh- whatever our field of study is, discussion is, if we're not going to recognize this or that, in this case, the Bible as being authoritative and being the authority, we've got a lot of ground to make up before we can ever get to that, st- which needs to be the starting point. Yeah, exactly. All right, so real quick, trying to wrap this up about the silent partner. I'm going to, so I've got a stack of notes here. We're wrapping up page one. So we're, we're not going to cover all of this. Like I said, I'll make copies for you if you would like them. Uh, just let me know before you leave today or email me, text me later in the week, whatever. Your silent partner, every chance you get, pray. Pray for the success, the study. Pray for that uh, prospect's heart to be softened to, and receptive to the gospel. Pray for wisdom for the person leading the study. Now, here, here's again where things are going to be different for everybody. You may have to babysit. Know that going in. For example, if you were to come have a Bible study at our house with Mason and Hudson there, there's going to be a lot of dinosaur roaring, growling, yelling, screaming, tackling one another, crying at times, all that kind of fun. Believe it or not, it would be very, very difficult for you to come have a Bible study with us at our kitchen table with all of that going on. I know that's a shocker. That's where your silent partner comes in. Remember, your goal as a silent partner, your only mission in life as that silent partner is to facilitate the study. So you may say, hey, boys, y'all want to go out in the backyard and play. Hey, boys, y'all want to go take a walk around the neighborhood, whatever it is. You may have to get down on the floor and play dinosaurs or have a tea party or whatever else. Get down on the floor and do it. Your job is to help the people that are in this study come to know Jesus Christ and become obedient to the gospel. That's your job there. If that means you've got to get down on the floor and play dinosaurs, 
get down on the floor and play dinosaurs, all right? Your job as the silent partner is to facilitate that stuff. Now, it's also possible you're with somebody that maybe they get kind of sidetracked on something. Maybe whoever's leading the study kind of gets twisted, gets in a bind with something, and they need a little help. Yeah, jump in and help them. Jump in, maybe, maybe they're not explaining something real well. You can tell the prospect is a little bit lost. Jump in and help clarify, help explain, and then go right back to being the silent partner, all right? If you know there's a need, okay, I've got to jump in and help clarify this, by all means, do that. But only do that if it's absolutely necessary. The rest of the time, sit there, pray, help facilitate the study, watch kids, whatever the case may be. Now, when you get there, you don't want to just walk in the door, and all right, let's sit down, let's start studying. You, 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 you want to lead into that, build up to that, warm them up just a little bit. This doesn't need to be any long 20, 30-minute conversation. You don't want to miss the point of why everybody is there. So let's say you go to somebody's home, find something there to compliment. I don't care what it is. Find something to compliment. Maybe the house smells great. Maybe you like some painting they have on the wall. Maybe you like their carpet. Maybe they've got a really nice TV that you really like. Whatever it is, find something. Walk in the door, find something there to compliment about their home. You're studying at somebody's office. Maybe you're meeting them after work, whatever. Find something to compliment, something to ask them, some sort of a, a lead-in question, some sort of a warm-up question. The questions you ask, don't ask them yes or no questions. I'm telling you right now, Ryan, Ryan will vouch for me on this. If you ask me a yes or no question, you will get a yes or a no answer. Why aren't you talking with them? You ask me yes or no questions. There's, there's no need to elaborate, all right? Ask them questions where they have to explain a little bit, where they have to talk a little bit. As I will tell you this, what is the number one topic in the world that people love to talk about? Themselves, right? Whether we want to think about it or, or admit it, deep down inside, places we don't talk about at parties, Every last one of us, to some degree or another, has a little bit of vanity and a little bit of selfishness inside of us. And we love to talk about ourselves. We love to talk about all the wonderful things we've done, all the cool places we've been, all the interesting people we know, all the th wonderful things we can do, how talented we are, whatever it may be. But we like to talk about ourselves. Ask them a question about themselves. More than one that's more than just a yes or no question. Get them a little warmed up. Get them to start talking to you. Do you want them to feel more comfortable talking to you? And I don't remember which lesson it came up in, but someone made the statement, people don't care what you know until they know how much you care. You start immediately asking them questions about themselves, finding out more information about them, getting to know them better. What's their first thought? Why they really do care about me, right? They're not just here to, to study with me. They're not just here so I can be another notch on their gun belt, as it were. They're here because they're really interested in me. They're here because they really care about me. They want to know about me. They're concerned about me. And that's the whole point of them being here. So make sure you go in, find something to compliment, find something you can ask them about, some sort of conversation piece, whatever the case may be. But here's the other part of that. You want to find out more information about them because that's going to help you in the study. If I go and study with somebody that's a football coach, well, I'm going to tie a lot of things back into that, use analogies that fit with that because it's going to help explain things to them a lot better. If I'm talking to someone from, say, Zimbabwe that's never in their life seen a football game, that's probably not going to be a real effective method of teaching them. I'm going to have to find other things about them, other ways I can reach them and make things appear uh, more real to them, make things make more sense to them. So we want to ask people these questions, we want to talk to them, we want to find out information about them because it warms them up to the study, but it's also going to help us maybe get some insight into them and how we can further reach them with the gospel, ways maybe we can explain things to them that are going to make a little bit more sense to them, or when it comes time to make that decision on whether or not to obey the gospel, it may help us to understand some of the hesitations they have in being obedient to that gospel message. 
Now, the other side of that coin, if we're going to ask questions about them, what do we have to do? We've got to listen, right? It does me no good to ask Cooper a question and then just kind of sit there and, and stare off into space and daydream off in la-la land, have no idea of what he said. I've wasted his time and mine. I haven't gotten to know that person any better. I haven't gained any insight, maybe how to reach them with the gospel message. All I've done is just let them sit there and talk while I'm thinking about you know, what I'm going to eat for supper. I'm thinking about my to-do list when I get home, whatever the case may be. Listen. Let them talk. Ask questions where you can, where you can maybe lead the conversation a little bit farther. Find out a little bit more about them. But the key thing in all of this is listen. Now, people are going to also tell you, especially go to someone's house, well, I'm sorry the house is such a mess. Don't acknowledge any apology like that. Skate right on past it, move on. Because as soon as you start acknowledging that, they immediately feel self-conscious about whatever it is they've just apologized for. They're in their back of the mind thinking, oh, what do they think about the house? Or what do they think about this? Or what do they think about that? Don't pay any attention to that. Move right along from that. You don't want to in any way set them up from the beginning in a negative mindset. You want them to be receptive. You want them to be, you want it to be a warm and open, a friendly environment. Not anything where they feel like they have to apologize. Anything where they feel like they need to be defensive. Now, the other part of this, as I mentioned again, make this a relatively brief conversation. You know, don't, don't spend 20, 30 minutes talking to them about, you know, this painting up there on the wall or this, you know, knickknack they have sitting over here on the counter. Talk to them a little bit, warn them up, find some information about them, listen to them. But remember, the point of, this, the point of being there is not to talk about their salt and pepper shaker collection. The point of being there is to sit down and study the Word of God with them. Now, we've gotten to all of that. It's time to sit down for the study. Do everything you can. Again, this goes back to the job of silent partner. Do everything you can to have a favorable environment for the study. You know, if there's radio blasting a bunch of tunes, politely ask if you can turn that off. Maybe there's a television show in the background. Again, ask if we can get that turned off. Maybe you've got children running around acting crazy. Maybe you've got a, an infant. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe you've got an infant that's crying. That's where your silent partner comes in to try and help facilitate some of that as well. You want them, whoever you're studying with, you want them to be able to sit down and focus solely on studying God's Word with you. Now, we're operating under the assumption here that you're studying with them at home. This doesn't apply so much if you're studying with them somewhere else. Ideally, if you can, study with somebody at their home. They feel more comfortable there. And if you can study with them at their home, the number one place you want to sit down and study with them is going to be at, at their kitchen table. Most people, when they make the important decisions in their life, that's where they make them. They're sitting around their kitchen table, looking, you know, pouring over the bills, those sorts of things. That's where you're going to be most likely to be able to sit down and study with them. It's also going to make it a lot easier. Uh, you know, for example, if you were to come to our house, try and sit in our living room, we've got a chair over here, a couch here, a love seat over here. It's hard for me and someone I'm studying with to sit there together to be able to, to point things out in the Bible, to be able maybe to sketch out some illustrations for them, things like that, that they can see. I've got to sketch it out, get up, walk across the room, hand it to them. Hey, what do you think about that? Then get it from them and then go back and sit down. It's not conducive to success in that study. Sit down at the table with them if at all possible. Have the prospect sitting right beside you. See, maybe they're sitting here at the head of the table, you're sitting on the side, but have them seated right there beside you so you can point things out in their Bible. You can sketch out illustrations for them and show them to them as you're doing it, those sorts of things. You want to try and make it, again, everything is revolving around facilitating, reaching them with the gospel. So if you can do that, by all means, do that. As we mentioned earlier, you want to use the Bible the prospect has if they have one. Because again, you don't want them to say, well, that's what your Bible says, or mine says something different. No, it doesn't. It's the same, ex same exact words. You want them to read it in black and white, as it were, from their Bible. They're far more likely to believe what it says if it's their Bible. Get them to read it out loud. That's where you come in. That's where your silent partner comes in as well. Y'all can all alternate through reading 
those passages. If you've got more than one person studying with you, maybe you've got a husband and wife, what have you, have everyone that's participating in the study take turns reading those scriptures. It keeps them involved, it keeps them engaged in the study. And it's a lot harder for me to tune out something I'm reading if I'm the one reading it rather than listening to somebody else reading. Somebody else, you know, Kevin's reading something, I may kind of zone out, tune out, space out, I have no idea what he's read. If I'm reading it out loud, I'm, I'm going to listen a whole lot better. But then also if you say, hey, well, everybody read this passage. Okay, what did you think about this? Well, did you really read it? Do you know how to pronounce that word? Do you know what that word means? There's a lot more room for, there, there's a lot more variables available there when you have everybody read it silently. So you want people to read it out loud. Now the other part of all this, what is our end goal in all of this? Whether it's you know, the first time we sit down and study, whether it's the tenth time we sit down and study with this person, what is the ultimate goal of the study? To save their soul, right? We want to start from the very beginning of the study. We're not trying to push anybody into anything. We're not trying to sell anybody anything. Don't misunderstand me here, okay? We're not trying to trick anybody. We're not trying to sell anybody anything. We're not working on commission here. We're studying with them because we love them. We want to save their soul. We want them to go to heaven. But sometimes that takes a little prodding. And so from the very beginning, from the very beginning, start kind of gently nudging them in that direction. All right? Don't just wait till the end of the study and say, all right, so you ready to be baptized? We want to start from the very beginning, just kind of nudge them, making them already start thinking about some things. Very beginning of your study, ask them, hey, if we were to find something in our study, we were to find something in the Bible that God wanted you to do that you haven't done, would you be willing to do that? Now, somebody that's sitting down with the Bible study for you, what's their answer almost certainly going to be? Yeah, of course I would. If I find something in the Bible that God wants me to do, yeah, I'm going to do it. All right, and that's, that's certainly the answer we want. Now, the other part of that you may follow up with, okay, would there be anything that God would want you to do that you would not be willing to do tonight or would not be able to do tonight? And maybe you find, okay, yeah, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But you go ahead and you start leading them, making them think about that from the get-go. Okay, yeah, I've already said there's nothing that's going to hinder me from doing whatever God wants me to do, whatever the Bible tells me God wants me to do. So we want to start doing that as quickly as we can and just start, start making them think about that process because that's ultimately the point where we want this to end up, whether it's that night, whether it's the next night, whatever the case may be. As much as possible, use the prospect's name, first name, and use it every time. You know, hey, Kenley, what do you think about this? Kenley, would you read this for me? Kenley, what's, what's this passage telling us here? Now, the reason for that, A, it increases your familiarity. You know, if, if I keep calling him over and over, I say, hey, Dover, what do you think? Or I say, hey, Mr. Kenley, or hey, Mr. Dover. It, it does, it's not indicating the same kind of relationship there. You want to use that first name basis, it increases familiarity. Subconsciously, it increases those bonds of relationship between you and the prospect. The other thing it does, it keeps your attention. How many of you ever sat in class at some point, you're sitting there, you're kind of off in la-la land, and all of a sudden the teacher calls out your name. You jump and you panic a little bit, right? So where are we? What are we doing? What am I supposed to be doing right now? Maybe that was just me in school, I don't know. I still today, anytime I'm somewhere, I hear somebody go, Perkins. It startles me a little bit. Now in the middle of a discussion, middle of a class, middle of a study, whatever, that's going to immediately get my attention right back. And if that's happening over and over and over again, hey, Matt, what do you think about this? Matt, read this for me. I don't have time to daydream. I don't have time to drift off and get lost. I've got to stay focused and locked in every step of the way. Here's the other thing. People like to hear their name. People like to know you're talking to them. Again, that goes back to that part inside of us. It's kind of vain and selfish. We like for people to talk about us and talk to us and think we're important. It makes us feel good. So when I'm using your name over and over again, instead of calling me, hey, you. Hey, they know, they know who I am. They know my name. 
I am important to them. You definitely want to do this when you're trying to emphasize an important point. Now, Kenley, the Bible says right here to do this. Or Kenley, what, what does this say right here? Because you want to draw them in. You want to make sure they're locked in, make sure they're focused on that. We want to try and emphasize areas of agreement. We're not here to be argumentative. We're not here to be a jerk. We're here to lead somebody to Christ. And that's not going to happen by us walking in there and telling them how ignorant they are, how foolish they are, how they don't know anything. No. Find places where we agree. The only place we may agree, as Brother Charles was talking about a minute ago, we may only agree that the Bible is God's Word. We may disagree about everything else. Well, hey, let's emphasize that point of agreement we have, and let's use that as a building block. Maybe there are other things we agree on. Okay, great. Now we've built an even stronger foundation. Now let's build off of that. We want to find areas where we can agree. How many of you, I want a quick show of hands. We're about to have to wrap this up. How many of you, one of your fears in engaging in a one-on-one Bible study, I want you to show your hands right here. Your number one fear in all of that is they're going to ask you a question you don't know the answer to. Okay, there's a lot of you. i got several people are not going to raise their hands, but several head nods too. Here's what I'm going to tell you. That is okay. It is perfectly okay to say, you know what, I don't know the answer to that question. But, let me go find out and come back. Let me go find out the answer to that question. We'll sit down and we'll talk about that another time. I've got 12 years of teaching experience. I don't know how many years I've taught world geography. There's still times a kid asks, Coach Perkins, what? I don't know. I have no idea. If I, now, if I really don't want to answer, I'll say, well, that's such a ridiculous question. You should know that by this point in your life. I'm not even going to waste my time with it. <laughs> or I'll turn to the smartest kid in class. Hey, Jimbo, what do you think about this? And let them answer it, you know. You don't want to do that in your study. It's okay to say, hey, I don't know. But I'll find out and I'll come back and we'll talk about that. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know. If it's something we're going to cover later, tell them, hey, it's a great question. Let me write it down. And we're going to get to that in just a little bit. Just hang with me. Just be patient. Okay? Time is up. There's, where I am right now, there's really no good way to end this. Uh, like I've, I've got nothing right here to kind of wrap this up. I will tell you this, guys. The, one of the most important things you're ever going to do in your life is sit down and study the Bible with someone that needs to come to know Jesus Christ. That's the whole point of this class series we're doing right now is to help us all to develop those skills and more importantly to develop the confidence to go do it. As I told you, if you want a copy of any of these notes, I'll be happy to give them to you. If you need a copy, want a copy of any of these resources that we have, we will get you or give you whatever you need. Let's go ahead in our hearts and our minds, let's focus on the goal here, and that's to bring the lost, to know Jesus. Let's use this opportunity every time we get it Sunday morning to study that, to learn about that, and learn how we can do that more effectively. Thank you for your time and your attention this morning. Thank you so very much for being here today.